met me. My name's Annie Allsop. I work with the, specifically with the pressure area care team at Invercare um, on a UK role now. I started with Invercare about eight years ago as a sales territory manager with a clinical hat. As a nurse, um, and a, as Judy was saying, I trained with Florence Nightingale too in the 80s. She was in, <laughs> she was in my group also. Um, Specialised in orthopaedics, oncology and cardiac specifically. But um, for that many years, it's fair to say that you see most things, I think. Um, also qualified midwife, so I think Rona would have been okay today. If she have come, it might have livened up events slightly. So we'll talk about Shia today. Some of the presentation touches on what Judy's already mentioned about postural control. Um, but hopefully this will give you some enlightenment to some of the issues that we face. Just go back a screen there. One of the things I didn't mention is that I'm currently doing a tissue viability, bi tissue viability nurse honorary contract with Worcester Health and Care Trust, which is, it's been running currently for a year and we're now on the second year. Um, working with the tissue viability teams down there, predominantly for community, but some hospital work as well. So the overview of this session. Definition of a pressure ulcer. Judy mentioned pressure ulcers in the first session. It's really important we focus on that in order to understand the sheer implications. Causes of pressure ulcers, touched on slightly, and mechanism of shear, more importantly. The effects of shear, postural control, brief summary at the end, it is a fairly short session and then a few minutes at the end for questions. Um, you may have something come up through the session but if you can hold that off to the end and then we can address those issues because it may be something that we'll talk, I'll talk about later. So definition of a pressure ulcer, I'd never think that a presentation with every due respect Judy is not complete without a definition. I'm one of those very old fashioned people that have to have definitions. The European Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel has updated all of their work this year more recently. And you can see here, we know that it's a localised injury of skin. We know that an underlying tissue, usually over a bony prominence, that's no surprise to anybody I wouldn't think here as a result of pressure or pressure in combination with shear. So it's actually a combined issue that we're now faced with. If you notice there, there's no mention of friction. Now, we talked a lot, and I, I didn't get one. I didn't want to shout up because I was a, a bit meek and mild at the front, so I didn't get one of those things that you threw. But we know that there's an awful lot of risk factors associated with pressure ulcer development and causes of pressure ulcer <coughs> development. But we're now moving away from friction being one of the main ones and we're looking really now at pressure and shear. So causes of pressure ulcers, this won't be a surprise to, to all of you here, you've got the body weight moving through the, uh, the, well, the bone, the weight of the bone, the skeleton, moving through the tissues, compressing the skin and then the interface surface moving up. So you get compression of tissues with this one, restricts the blood supply, cuts down the oxygen as we've already mentioned. Shear is slightly different. Shear is the surface of the bed, mattress, any surface, cushion, whatever that support surface is, the bone moves along it in either direction and what it does, it contorts the muscles. The skin stays where it is. It can have a slight shift but what we're faced with here is contortion of the muscle. It's almost wringing out those layers of delicate skin underneath. Think of it if you, as you will, because I was a bit of a foodie as well. I kind of have to bring food in somewhere. And this was an analogy that Mark came up with, so I can't take credit. But think of this as a cake, if you like, a cream cake, where the pressure, you'll squash the cake, you'll damage the cake. Still eatable, we can all do that. But shear is the top surface moving over the bottom surface and what you end up with is jam and cream all over the place realistically. Still be eaten, but what it does, it presses and squashes the contents of those two layers and actually causes a lot more damage. We end up with far more mess. So thanks for that, Mark. Another foodie in the room. So it's a parallel forces. <coughs> it causes the skin to pull away from the deeper layers and it can cause tissue damage. Let's look at shear forces. You can see by the photographs here the direction of movement that the skeleton's going to move in, in the seated position and, almost, <coughs> and also the semi-recumbent position. It's often created by gravity. I think very few of us now will stand in a really good postural position. If we try to do that, we probably can't maintain it for too long. 
Seating's the same. I'm terrible at a seated position, which is adopted from a car position. I do do a lot of sacral sitting. And I think now the lives that we lead, lead us into that posture, even when we don't have compromises, even when we're quite able to sit in an upright postural position. So the natural gravity <coughs> takes us forward. We slip down the bed or the chair. It causes the skin to actually stretch causes the blood flow to be reduced, your dermal capillary beds are stretched and narrow and it pinches the blood supply. It squashes or bends or pinches and distorts that underlying tissue and it can result in deep tissue injury. So that's it as a close-up version of what it does to the skin. You can see the layers here. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by talking through the layers of the skin, but what it does is it drags that top layer across and contorts all of this central area, nerve supply, blood supply, nerve endings, all of those essential factors, waste products, they're all being dragged. And the internal structures are quite distorted, quite considerably for a small amount of time. And the results can be catastrophic. That's an example of what we'd expect to see, or rather try to avoid, with the effects of shear. Now you can see here on the top layer of skin, it almost looks like excoriation, it almost looks like a burn. And that's essentially what it is. It's actually dragging or burning or pulling the skin, a little bit like um, taking a, a dressing off or a plaster off the skin. <coughs> slightly overzealous, you rip the top layer of skin. So that's one effect of what you could expect to see with a shear force uh, tissue damage. The other issue is deep tissue injury. Now realistically I think in the past and, and very often we now still blame deep tissue injury for pressure damage. We still allude it to the fact that it's pressure that's caused the problem. But very often the deep tissue injury can be um, misclassified almost in the case that it's caused by pressure. We can see from the earlier photograph that it's actually ripped the surface of the skin. So we could actually say, well, that's friction or it's shear. And it gives <coughs> us the idea of how to manage that and how to prevent it from being, becoming worse, becoming more severe. But I think really more often now, we're still putting these deep tissue injuries down to pressure. And it's this awareness to feed that forward and take it forward to reduce this number of incidents. Because we can measure pressure, we can't measure shear that well. We can check for shear, but we don't have a ward-based, current, accurate measurement of how much shear is going through a patient's skin. And this one is often the most difficult to heal. And it's the one that takes the longest to heal. And very often it's the one that's not detected that quickly. Because the skin's not broken, it can very often be misclassified as a grade one. If you imagine just light finger pressure on there, it's not going to react. The skin's intact. But actually, these are your additional classifications of deep tissue injury that are really quite severe, that are often misclassified. We're all familiar with the areas of pressure damage as being over a bony prominence. We've all got bony prominences all over our body, and it's wherever the bone actually hits a pinnacle. With shear, it's much greater. And actually, to do a circle big enough almost fills the whole screen. But what happens with shear, your pressure damage points are here where the bony prominence are, specifically heel and sacral areas, particularly with a seated patient, We've got the really high... ITs and incidentally sitting on the Libra cushion in there I've got a very bony bottom don't record that but I've got a very bony bottom <laughs> and actually felt as if I it was fairly sort of contour you know con contoured on that cushion very well supported well, what tends to happen with shear is the body will move forward and potentially that area here to here is the area of drag specifically specifically rather in a chair it's here that's the main drag area. Very often you'll, you might see in practice a drag behind the legs where you can actually feel your own skin contorting if you slump down a chair yourselves. And what will happen with the heels is there'll be a lot of pressure going through, but logic tells us if the client is able to reposition those heels, they'll go forward with them and they'll be pressed against the floor. And then that body force will cause excessive shear in the heel area as well.
Very difficult to look for heel damage. It's very difficult to, to actually see without use of a mirror or bending yourself in a position where you can clearly see that area. So the heels are particularly at risk with poor seating because the heels you can't see quite as well as you can see and examine a sacral area of skin. So in skin inspection is very, very difficult on a heel. Posture control is really the key to preventing a lot of shear damage in patients that are seated. Poor seating can greatly increase the risk. So we need to get that right before we can control these issues. You can see here patients on, to, on a seat that's too wide for him. And what will tend to happen is there's your pressure damage point here, but that will be where your shear damage is right the way down that side where the skin will actually be pulled because the seat is too wide, they'll go for a certain area. So all of that side is actually the at-risk area. A seat that's too low, again, pressure points, massive, really, really high, massive pressure points through here. But again, if a client or patient's able to move the feet, the logic will tell you that they will go where? They'll go forward, won't they put the feet forward? Seat's too high. Good example next door on the pressure mapping feet dangling on that chair, that was nice and high for me. What tends to happen is you get pressure points here as well, but you'll tend to get a slump forward so you can reach the floor. So to get the posture right will inevitably prevent people getting into a position where they're pulling away at the skin. Too long, again, and too short. So if the seat itself, the depth of the seat's not right, they'll try and compromise to get that position right. Or even if they're not able to reposition themselves, the skeletal tr structure will try and compromise. So it could be actually an involuntary movement. We know, we experience, and we see day to day, um, and we work with people with postural control issues. It's not straightforward. It's not that simple. And those of you that are ITs in the room, um, I'm sure can tell us a lot of stories and a lot of history about complex needs that you've dealt with. But with postural control issues here, we might not be able to achieve optimum postural control. So it's no good me standing here as a nurse in front of you, as OTs, some of you, to say we need to get the postural control right, because that may not be possible. Um, my mother, who passed on a few years ago, she led me into life with one saying that I always remember, and that was you can only do the best with what you've got. You can't do any more. So we'd come home from an exam, or did you try your hardest? Did you try your best? And sometimes as nurses and clinicians and prescribers, that's what we have to do. I do believe you've got the answer with this cushion. I do believe that the Libra is going to sort out a lot of these issues. But we may not be able to achieve optimum posture <coughs> control with everybody. Judy mentioned earlier, alluded to pelvic obliquity and posterior pelvic tilt. Also scoliosis. So you now have a cushion where you can try to compromise or try and address those compromises with the skeletal control. So you may not be able to maintain it. So it could be a position where you could actually achieve postural control, but the thought process is, can that be maintained? How long can they then sit in that area? I kind of felt like I could have sat in that chair all day, but that's just me, really. Poor muscle tone is one. The first thing that sort of tends to give is the fact that you can't support yourself in that good position. So the seated position that you can put your clients in they may not be able to maintain that control. Muscular dystrophy, for example. Hemiplegia, um, strokes, CVA, cerebral vascular accidents, where you don't have control from one side of the body. So therefore, the body weight takes it over. <coughs> so you put somebody in a really good postural control position, turn your back, look back again, and there's an arm hanging out the chair. And the whole shift has gone to that side, and the whole shear has gone down that right side too. Body spasm, um, again, something we can't control. Um, motor neurone disease, um, mu muscular dystrophy, not muscular dystrophy, um, multiple sclerosis, where one moment it's fine, and it could be a short time after, it could be a prolonged period after, but there's an issue of body spasm. And with body spasm we is friction, but also there's a shift in movement, or can be shift in movement. And there's also compliance. We can try our best. We can do what my mum led me to believe was the right thing to do, which was to, to do your best. But actually, if your client or your patient's 
not happy about that or not completely convinced about that or has issues with that or not able for some other reason to cope with what you're recommending for them, then there is a compliance or non-concordance issue. Postural control really, um, we've said solution, but it is the solution to cutting down shear and reducing shear in really vulnerable areas. So postural control is the key. A high quality cushion. Now, my thought process is in a bed, we prescribe a mattress, which is where I where I lie really almost, pardon the pun, um, we can control the support surface and we can sort of encompass the whole of the patient's body. So if they do shift position, they're non-compliant or they have body spasm, it's short-lived and then they can reconvene a position in that bed surface. Does, does that make sense to everybody? So you're almost sort of encompassed, it almost a beanbag situation if you were to lie on a beanbag. So these things would go ahead, but actually then the body finds another place where it's okay to be for a while. In a chair, it's very different. So these forces can take shape in a chair and they stay as a risk force. And actually they become progressively worse unless we address the issue. So seating is key. I do a lot of training with Worcester Health and Care Trust nurses and they seem quite surprised sometimes when you show a picture of the ischial tuberosity damage, real pinpoint pressure damage, and they say the mattress isn't working as it should. And it inevitably, there's a few of you smiling, it's the seat. It's the, it's the pressure through the skeleton, through the ischial tuberosities of a seat that is the problem, that they've not really managed 24 hours, we'd call it care. But there still seems to be that light bulb moment when they'll go, oh yeah, it could have been that. So the seat, unfortunately, a lot of nurses still, and and one, would think about a seating uh, pressure reduction or posture after the bed surface. There seems to be an awful lot of control over the bed surface and then secondary to that comes the seating. So it's this mindset almost that we need to educate and control and take control of to prevent this tissue damage that we're seeing more and more. Because deep tissue injury now has its own category. It didn't before. It now has its own, so we know we're seeing more and more of it. For NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, and the European Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel to actually address, because it is a big issue. But we don't know how many are caused by what reason really yet. So a high level of skin protection these cushions will offer. Excellent positioning. Judy uh, alluded to it earlier about putting people in this position where you're spreading out the pressure at the back, you're spreading the pressure between the knees, you're evenly distributing the pressure. But this is not necessarily about pressure reduction. It's about the move and the shift that the body, the natural body gravity would create that creates a shear. And it's addressing those areas that we have a particular challenge with. And we now have the answer, I think. So just to summarise, because there may be some questions in a moment, just to summarise, shear is a major cause of pressure ulcer development. We don't know how many ulcers are caused by shear. We don't know how many ulcers are caused by pressure. We don't know how many ulcers are caused by incontinence issues. We, we can't summarise that, but we know because there is such a large amount of them, it's now been put into the definition. By reducing shear, we can greatly reduce the risk of deep tissue injury and we can <coughs> certainly um, avoid unnecessary patient harm. Um, all of the new directives and strategies from the Department of Health and the government are all driven towards harm-free care. But actually, I don't know whether she mentioned to you, Judy, um, Florence Nightingale, she originally quoted it. <laughs> it was 19... <laughs> she mentioned it to me over lunch one day. Um, it was, she was about 1940-something, and she said, we will do our patients no harm. So this is not new. Harm-free care is not new. It was said a long time ago, but we're just revisiting what we already know. We shouldn't be creating harm for patients. We should be looking after them, sending them home without skin damage, having had the treatments. But unfortunately, what we do is send them home with pressure ulcers or we keep them in with pressure ulcers because we don't manage the sheer implication of the risk as well as we could. So there's a number of areas at risk when the patient is seated. There's far greater areas at risk than if the patient is lying down in bed. The pressure is not spread out quite so well. We know with a, bed, a patient lying in bed, there is the risk using profile in beds where you get contortion in the back 
um, skin where it's pulled and tightened, but far more so in the chair. Poor seating can greatly increase the risk of tissue damage, so it's getting that right that is the key. <coughs> Postural control cushions, as we know from this morning's session, can increase stability and therefore reduce the shear forces. Mm -hmm.